Welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. Today, we have with us a very special guest, Dr. Hyrie Kleiman, MD, PhD, physician scientist and director of the Reproductive and Placental Research Unit in the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Sciences at the Yale University School of Medicine. He holds over 10 patents and is specialized in research as it pertains to complications in pregnancy and complex cases of infertility, especially implantation failure. He has also developed several tests and methods to assist patients to have successful outcomes. Thanks so much for being here today, Dr. Kleiman. My pleasure, Christina. All right, so we're going to jump right in and and start talking about, you know, failed implantation and endometrial receptivity. Well, I think it would be helpful for the listeners to get a little perspective about the endometrium. So let me back up a little bit before we talk about what goes wrong. Let's talk about how things work normally. And I think it's really important to understand that the endometrium is a unique tissue in the human. There's no other tissue like it. Of course, women are very special, and now they have within them this amazing special lining of their uterus that um, is unique in the way it behaves. What am I talking about? If you look at the liver, for example, your liver is basically pretty stable. If you take blood tests to test your liver, we call those liver function tests. If you do that today and if you're healthy, they'll be the same next week, next month, next year, right? Unless something changes. Uh, how about your height? Your height is basically stable once you're an adult. Um, for women who do mammography, you know, we don't expect it to change. We maybe expect you to do that once every two years or something. We don't need to do it once a week, right? For three weeks in a row, for example. The endometrium literally changes every single day. From one day to the next, it is different. Mm -hmm. And that's why we call it the menstrual cycle. So let's just think about the menstrual cycle for a minute and even why humans have a menstrual cycle. Understanding that will give us some insight into what can go wrong with the endometrium and why sometimes it doesn't work normally. So the endometrium um, is specialized because of the way that human pregnancy works. When you get pregnant and an embryo actually lodges in to the surface of the uterus called the endometrium, the lining, the inside lining of the uterus, the blastocyst, which is that early embryo, it's like a little ball. The outer surface of that ball is made up of cells called trophoblasts, which will become the placenta. Now the human placenta is very aggressive. And so it would, if it was just left to its own accord, it would literally invade right through the uterus. That's how aggressive it is. Wow. So in order to protect herself, the woman, right after the window of implantation is opened up, there's like this very short period of time that the endometrium says, okay, I'm going to allow you to attach and invade. Immediately, it puts up a brick wall to protect itself from that invasive you know, embryo. Now, let's say you don't get pregnant. You're you know, not planning on being pregnant. You're just having a natural cycle and you go through your menstrual cycle. Well, the endometrium doesn't know there isn't a blastocyst there. So it puts up the brick wall after that window of implantation. And if it were just to be left there and nothing happened, you could never get pregnant ever. So you have to slough the lining of the uterus and start all over. That's the reason that our species has a menstrual cycle. And so now when you talk about looking at the endometrium, when do you look at it? I told you every single day is different. If you take day one, which is the first day of your period, that's what we call cycle day one. Women have you know various ranges of their menses, maybe four days, maybe five days, et cetera. Then after the blood stops flowing and all the tissue is passed, the endometrium starts to grow and thicken to get ready for the hope that there might be a blastocyst coming into the uterine cavity. Now, we'll talk about that implantation step in a minute, but let's just talk about what happens when there isn't a blastocyst. Well, it's ready, it's ready, it's waiting. It's like being stood up on a date, I would say. And uh, you know, then when there's no date, the blastocyst isn't there. The endometrium thickens and it has to start all over again. So that's what the menstrual cycle is. So when do you look at an endometrium to even assess the question, is it normal? Is it functioning normal? Well, in my mind, you can't just look at one date, right? Because it's changing all the time. 
Now, obviously, for practical purposes, we also can't look at every single day. So the test that we developed, which is called the endometrial function test, very much like the liver function test or the pulmonary function test, I named it that way to give the concept that this was a functional test to look at how the endometrium was working. We designed it to look at two critical points of the cycle, and I'm going to talk about how the cycle is put together in a minute and then understand why we looked at it the times we did. So as I said, in the first day of menses, the tissue is sloughing and it's sort of being discarded from the lining of the uterus, and then it grows. It grows in response to estrogen. Estrogen is the hormone that thickens the endometrium. When the endometrium gets to this optimal thickness, then we start adding progesterone. Progesterone stops the endometrium from proliferating, from growing, and changes it in a process we call differentiation, actually specializing the tissue to get ready for implantation. And again, literally every single day it changes. So progesterone starts about the evening of day 13 on a natural cycle. And if you look at an endometrium on day 14, and then on day 15, and 16, and 17, and 18, 19, all those samples look completely different. They literally change almost every 12 hours, I would say. I mean, I can almost date the endometrium to a 12-hour period. So that's pretty specific. So we chose day 15 because that's the very beginning of the progesterone effect on the endometrium. And then the next time that we decided to look at the endometrium is on day 24, when basically the endometrium has finished differentiating. Um, so that's why the endometrium is complex. It changes every day. Testing it is complex. And people have designed different tests to look at it functionally. I didn't mention this to your listeners, and I will do it now. And this, I think, is an important insight. The endometrium is not a piece of scotch tape, right? It's not just a sticky surface that an embryo attaches to. It's actually the analogy I give. It's like a fruitcake. Mm -hmm. The fruitcake has cake and inside of it pieces of fruit, right? The cake is the stroma. It's the thing that holds everything together. And the little pieces of fruit are the glands of the endometrium, the endometrial glands, which are going to secrete things to actually feed the early embryo when it attaches to mom's lining of the uterus. And then, and I hated fruitcake as an aside, there are all these little red, little dried cherry candied in there. I don't know, I know if you've ever gross. I don't yeah. know who, I don't know anybody. I don't know why anybody would exactly. like Exactly. <laughs> who eats fruitcake? I apologize <laughs> to the fruitcake makers of the world. But anyway, the little pieces of red are the blood vessels, right? So that's really what the endometrium is. It's the stroma, the cake the glands, the pieces of fruit, and the mm -hmm. blood vessels, right? So the glands and the stroma are really independent but interconnected. A lot of the patients I see that have problems with implantation have a disconnect between the stroma, which is going too quickly, and the glands, which are left behind. Mm -hmm. What is controlling this? Progesterone. If you give too much progesterone, it will cause the stroma to jump ahead and build up that brick wall that I said to you. And by the time the embryo gets there, it can't implant. One thing I was just teaching our fellows here at Yale recently, as I was talking about plan B, mm -hmm. that's sort of the opposite of wanting to get pregnant. That's not wanting to get pregnant. Mm -hmm. Well, what is plan B? Plan B is nothing more than progesterone. So if you give lots of progesterone, you will make the brick wall and you won't get implantation. So that's fascinating because as I see it in terms of, you know, guiding women through this fertility journey when they're doing IVF, it seems to me like most women, regardless of size, age, background, what have you, are getting the same dosages of progesterone, um, either an injection or um, orally or, or um, as a suppository. And so is there some way with the EFT test that you've developed or, you know, from in some other way to, to really understand how much this particular patient, like how much progesterone this particular patient needs and how much is going to be detrimental for them. 
I think that's a fantastic question. I wish that more REIs thought about what you just asked. And the problem is, with all due respect to my colleagues, I am in the REI section at Yale, so I work with these people all the time. I think people like to have routine protocols. I think that's a natural human tendency, right? This is the way we do things. And when you start adding customization, right, to vary, varying things based on a patient, well, it starts to get kind of complicated, right? However, um, there are patients where we need to customize things for that patient. There's no question. And in fact, I want to go back to estrogen and say that, and just show you the interconnection between estrogen and progesterone for a minute. Estrogen is just as important to actually give in a regulated fashion. Correct. Now, I'm I'm old fashioned this way. I, I tend to think that nature has figured this out after millions of years of evolution. Mm -hmm. And if you look at a natural cycle of a healthy, fertile woman, estrogen very slowly, gradually goes up. And then it reaches a certain peak and then it starts to go down again. And progesterone starts on about day 13. There's a little blip of progesterone on day 13 and it gradually goes up and it peaks only at about day 21, 22. So what do we do in our country? We give a fixed amount of estrogen to all different women when, as you know, uh, we do have a problem of obesity in our country. Women who are overweight are what are called hyperestrogenic. They mm -hmm. naturally have more estrogen. Mm -hmm. And so by just giving them the quote unquote standard dose, they may actually be getting five times as much estrogen as they actually need yeah. to develop their endometrium. Now, what is the connection between estrogen and progesterone? Estrogen upregulates the progesterone receptor. Now that's let's let's let that sink in. Estrogen causes the endometrial glands and stroma to develop on the cell surface, the receptor for progesterone. Mm -hmm. If you have five times as much progesterone receptor, your endometrium is going to be five times as responsive with the same dose of progesterone. So already we're starting off with a problem, right? We have now too much progesterone receptor, too much estrogen because the patient endogenously has too much estrogen. And then you give a fixed dose of progesterone. And I call that a square function. You know, there's no progesterone. And all of a sudden there's a bolus of, you know, I am progesterone, a fixed dose. That's completely different from the natural cycle. We have too much estrogen, too much progesterone receptor, and then too much progesterone. So when you add all those together, it's actually for me, I'm surprised that we get as many women pregnant as we do with these standard doses, right? And regimens as you implied. Now, Einstein said something I think which is uh, appropriate to quote at this point. If you do something over and over again and you don't change anything, then it really, you're not thinking if you expect a different result, right? So in other words, just to take women, give them the standard protocol, have them go through a cycle, it doesn't work, do it again and again, and just say, well, I hope it'll work someday. To me, it's like, well, the first time it's okay to do the standard protocol because we're so successful with so many women. But when we don't get it right the first time, I think we should take a pause and just ask ourselves, well, maybe this woman is not going to be the standard woman that we need use our standard protocols for. Maybe we need to customize what we do. And that's why we developed the endometrial function test to help the doctor actually taking care of these women customize the stimulation protocol for that particular woman. And I'm seeing a good number of women with, um, you know, that are having implantation failure with good, healthy embryos. And um, I'm interested to talk a more about the EFT. Um, so, you know, what are the challenges? How do we start to maybe look at integrating this and and what does that look like for the patients and for the centers so yeah i mean that's a great question first of all let me just cogitate on it and figure out the best way to answer it i think it goes back to what i said before about people liking routine regulated protocols right uh you know do these doctors are not trying to hurt patients right i mean they are trying to help the patient and from their point of view, if they have a 
standardized protocol that they deal with with all patients and a significant number of them get pregnant, <clears throat> then rightfully so, they feel that they're doing a good job, right? And I have no complaints about that. And that's why I would actually not recommend doing any kind of endometrial receptivity testing or specialized testing until a patient has at least gone through one transfer cycle, right? Because we are actually pretty good at this in spite of all the things we just talked about, mm -hmm. which is a testament to how, um, I guess, adaptable the woman's body is in terms of getting pregnant. So that's, that's a good thing. I, the question in my mind is raised of what you do when you don't get a patient pregnant, especially I'm going to take it to the extreme when you have donor oocytes. Mm -hmm. Now, I think there's a cost benefit analysis going on here. When you look at the total cost of a donor oocyte cycle, uh, it's high, right? That's a lot of money. Now we're having, you know, uh, oocytes from a donor, which you have to pay for and all the technology to get those and then fertilize them and transfer them with a, you know, presumably a frozen embryo transfer, or let's even make it more expensive, a surrogate, right? Whether they're your own, you know, eggs and sperm or somebody else's, right? There's a whole mix and match there. But the point is, is that the more expensive the technology that we're using, the more it seems reasonable to me that we should do a dress rehearsal, right? Just to see if this particular surrogate, if the particular mother with the mock cycle that you're going to, the transfer cycle that you're going to be using is actually going to work. Again, on the other extreme, if you have a young woman who happens to have a tubal problem, let's just say, but everything else is okay. And we have 15 euploid embryos, right? Normally, karyotypically normal embryos, frozen, right? Then I'm not as worried about what we do, right? Use your standard protocol, try it once, maybe even try it again. You have all that buffer and that backup. So it's not as you know concerning. But when you get down to very few embryos, the last embryo that that patient will ever have, a $100,000 embryo, you know, and uterus, then it's like, okay, to add a test that can help figure out what's going on seems cost effective to me. Mm -hmm. And I personally don't understand in those extreme cases why, you know, everything isn't used. Now, we haven't talked about the other tests that are out there, but I would just say the endometrial function test has is looking at molecular markers of the development of the endometrium. And I'm going to give another analogy to sort of compare things. I view the endometrium as like a plane on a runway, a little Cessna ready to take off. When we do an endometrial function test, we're actually looking at the plane just as it starts to come off the runway. We're looking at all the estrogenic effects, how fast the plane is going, what estrogen is doing. And we're looking at the very beginning of pulling back on that stick. Day 24 is, did the plane reach 12,000 feet? It's, you know, its destination altitude. Is it flying at level flight and did it reach where it should reach? Notice that we did not design it to look at, quote unquote, the window of implantation, supposedly the day that the embryo is supposed to attach to the lining of the uterus, which happens around day 19 or 20. We looked at it in terms of looking at the plane from a distance, you know, and just like you would be looking at a plane going down a runway, even if you're not in the plane, you could tell if things were going normally, just how fast the plane was running down the runway, too much estrogen too fast down the runway. If you're going too fast down the runway, pulling back even on the stick a little bit would make the plane go up too high. That's because of there's too much progesterone receptor, right? So you could at a distance figure out the ultimate quality of that takeoff, how the plane was doing and did it get to altitude just by looking at those two points. So that's that's why we designed the endometrial function test that way. And is it then, something, I'm so sorry to interrupt, is it no something problem. that you would do a mock cycle with? And I and I definitely want to get into the differences between this and the R ERA and the receptiva, the other sort of endometrial tests available. But yes, is it is it a mock cycle that you would do? Or is this like, it's in the actual cycle that you're doing the transfer that you're doing these biopsies? Great question. So you we can't do these tests, which is one of the sort of limitations of endometrial function testing, if you will in the transfer cycle itself. So we have to do it in a mock cycle. Uh, we have to do it. And in fact, one thing I wanna make clear, 
the cycle that you do the testing in, in my opinion, has to match exactly what the transfer cycle will be. Mm -hmm. There's already enough biological variability in people from, especially women with a menstrual cycle from month to month, right? As we were talking about, that you have to try to limit this variability. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to suppress with Lupron in the transfer cycle, and if you're going to start that Lupron, which turns off the woman's hormones coming from her pituitary, if you're going to do that in the actual transfer cycle, and if you're going to give estrogen vaginally or orally or whatever by patches, and if you're going to give X amount, then the mock cycle has to exactly match that and the day that you start progesterone and the route that you give progesterone and how much progesterone you give. You can't have a mock cycle with one protocol and a transfer cycle with a different one. So that's you know a given that you have to do that, in my opinion. So that that's great to know, and I figured that you know you're not going to be doing a biopsy in the you know in a cycle where there's a little embryo trying to implant there. Um, but just wanted to clarify now this part the you know getting these exact dosages and timing. Um, this is sounding similar to the ERA, but I know it is not the same as the ERA, and I know you have your own viewpoint about said test. So could you share with us, Dr. Kleiman, um, you know, the difference, and I would like to get into the receptiva too, but the difference between the ERA and the EFT and your concerns about the ERA. What has turned out to be true is that the ERA is really a dating test. That's in essence what it's doing. It's not doing it by histology, by looking under the microscope. It's doing it by molecular markers but the result of the ERA, what is told to the doctor is, this is the date of this endometrium. And you need to transfer the embryo either 12 hours before or later or 24 hours before or give progesterone for a little more before you do the transfer. So the only output of the ERA is this adjustment to the transfer date. So it's a dating test. Dating by itself has been shown to not be reliable in terms of dealing with women who have infertility. And I'll liken it, again, I give a lot of analogies here. A car that's out of tune and running poorly is not going to run any better if you move it up or down the driveway. You actually have to open up the hood and look at the engine and see why the car is not running well. And that has always been my criticism about the ERA is that it doesn't actually tell the doctor what to do to fix the problem. Simply changing the transfer date is actually not effective. And there was a paper in our main journal called Fertility and Sterility in October 2022 that basically showed that it was worse to do the ERA for patients than doing nothing in terms of their outcomes by doing these adjustments. So I think um, people have, I think a lot of people, not everybody, it takes time to change people's minds. Um, you know, a lot of people are realizing the ERA is not the right way to go about looking at endometrial receptivity. I have a quick um, question just to clarify something. And, and that is, so we spoke earlier in this session about you know, the different stages of, of, you know, how things change in the endometrium, you know, as it starts to respond to progesterone and obviously as it was building and responding to estrogen. Now I could see why, just from this discussion, why somebody would say, oh, the ERA might be a good idea based on that. Like, oh, there are, you know, there, there seems to be a window where a person's endometrium is more receptive according to what we discussed earlier. And so how is that, um, how is that different with what the ERA is 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 offering? Yeah, that's a great, great question. That's a great question also. So if it was just as simple of estrogen and progesterone and nothing else was involved with this situation, then in fact, it probably would be a good test. They might have medical conditions, right, that could interfere with their endometrial development, for example. And one example is endometriosis. What is endometriosis? That is a long-term medical problem that women have, especially in our society where women reproduce much later. Their cervix is tight for a long time. They have many, many more menses in their lives than his, you know, historically, as in a thousand years ago, women would normally have. And 
not every woman has this, but there's a tendency for every time there's a menses, especially when the cervix is tight, for menstrual debris to go backwards through their fallopian tubes into their pelvis. Now, there is discussion about the etiology of endometriosis, and there are different theories about stem cells and what's called retrograde menstruation, which is what I said. But however it gets there, it is it interferes with the very delicate interplay of the stroma and the glands. Remember, we talked about their interplay before, and the stroma is carrying the glands like the wave. Well, there, there are a lot of signals that are going between the stroma and the glands to tell the glands what to do, and everything has to be in order. Step one, step two, step three, one by one. If there is inflammation in the pelvis of a woman, that, that can interfere with this normal you know, development of the endometrium. Now, one of the other things that's missing in the ERA is that a piece of endometrium is homogenized, put into a little tube, and as I said, molecular markers are looked at. What I do when I look at the endometrium is I physically look at it under the microscope and I can see when there's inflammation. I can see neutrophils, which are cells that respond to bacteria. So I know when there's a bacterial infection in the uterine cavity. I know when there are macrophages there, which is commonly present when there's endometriosis. I see women that have tuberculosis in their endometrium. The thing is that there are abnormalities in the way the endometrium grows. There's called endometrial hyperplasia, which the endometrium is overstimulated. And that's actually a precursor potentially of um, at least low-grade cancers and things like that. So when I look at the lining of the uterus, to put it in simple terms, I'm not just doing the molecular markers we talked about and the you know how it's developed the plane taking off i'm looking inside the plane to make sure there aren't any mice in the plane uh, cockroaches in the plane you know mold in the plane right things that are can interfere with the functioning of that plane right and uh, when i find those things i tell the doctor you need to suppress the patient for potential endometriosis maybe you need to do a laparoscopy mm -hmm. if there's tuberculosis we have to get rid of that. If there's hyperplasia, we have to deal with that problem. Do you see the difference between the two? The ERA doesn't look at any of those things. Well, it's sounding to me like like the EFT is is just much more comprehensive. It, it's looking at all factors. It's almost like a combination of what the ERA does and what the um, receptiva does, um, because I, I'm, I think the receptiva is very focused on endometriosis, inflammation, and then consequently, you know, the treatment is generally Lupron suppression. So maybe it also helps a clarifying question about, uh, you know, course of treatment. And I think you sort of answered this, but course of treatment with ERA is basically timing of the transfer. And I'm not sure if anything else, uh, how much progesterone they're giving, you know, it's like estrogen progesterone timing. And then with receptiva, it's more just lupron suppression in, it, it, that I have heard of. Um, and with the EFT, you're describing with all these different potential mice and issues in the plane, um, a, a various courses of treatment, um, whether it is surgery, suppression, um, antibiotics, and what have you. Would, would you say that's accurate? Or you know, if you want to elaborate further, go ahead. No, I think you did a perfect job. That's exactly the difference. It, in a way, the endometrial function test, EFT, is a dating test, mm -hmm. just routine histology. That's mm -hmm. what the ERA does. It also looks at the developmental markers, right, which is, I guess, what the ERA is trying to do a little bit. But I think that's unique. The ERA doesn't look at specific developmental markers in terms of how estrogen and progesterone are working. I want to go back to something you said before, and you know, you were asking, why don't people do the EFT? I alluded to this before, but I think it's a good time now to bring it up again. This takes a lot of work, what we're talking about, right? I mean, first of all, you have to plan a mock cycle. You have to do it exactly the way the transfer cycle is going to be. Ideally, you're going to take two biopsies, day 15 and 24. 
if you only choose one, you have to always do the 24. The 15 helps. In other words, the 24 is, did the plane get up at altitude? I mean, that's useful. If it isn't at altitude and I don't have the day 15, I'm less in a position to tell the doctor what went wrong, right? I know the plane didn't take off. It's at the end of the runway. It's crashed, but I don't know why. The day 15 helps me figure out, you know, debriefing and figuring out and analyzing why it went wrong. The two of them together, I think, give me a good handle on helping doctors actually modify in a very concrete way what to do, whether it's an intervention medically like Lupron or surgery or antibiotics, or everything could be fine except for what the stimulation is. It could just be the stimulation, right? So I and stimulation, give them- Are you referring to the estrogen and progesterone? Yes, the estrogen and progesterone. How much estrogen, um, how much progesterone, the slope of the curve of the progesterone. And so when I do my reports, which includes pictures of the endometrium compared to uh, normal controls, I don't, I think you're too young for colonoscopy, I'm guessing. But anybody who's had a colonoscopy out there, what's kind of cool now is they give you literally, it's kind of wild, pictures of your own colon, right? That they just, you know, took and looked at. So you go, okay, this is what they found. Well, in a way, I do the same thing for my doctors and patients. I take pictures of the endometrial biopsy. So I not only say what's happening, I refer to the picture and say, see, there are the macrophages, you can see them, there are the neutrophils, there's the abnormal development, this is the problem, and this is what I suggest you do. It does help patients. I'm very proud of doctors who do use it. My ideals of physicians, which is the best care for their patients, they will take the time to figure out what's going on. They will not do a cookie cutter approach to their patients, and they want to give their patients every chance possible to try to have a family. That you describe this uh, mock cycle doesn't actually seem to be very different, in my opinion, than what you have to go through for an ERA or a receptiva um, test. So it's very disappointing, for sure, that this wouldn't be offered more. And and this is why I was so excited to have you as a guest is you know, to get that education out there, because what I've really seen um, that kind of initiates change in these centers is you, the listeners, um, asking for these things and advocating for yourself and, and you can forge the change. And it actually gives me great comfort to know that you specifically, the creator, um, you know, and this scholar is reviewing the results and giving the direction. That's an amazing opportunity for our listeners. Um, so Dr. Kleiman, if if our listeners are interested in pursuing this this route, and, and, I, and you have said clearly that their doctor has to be game to go forward, where would they find you and how would they connect with you to be able to go forward? So certainly patients can email me anytime, harvey.kleiman at yale.edu. They can express interest. I will send them a standardized email back, which basically gives an overview of the endometrial function test compared to the ERA and receptiva. Thank you for sharing your contact information. And we'll be putting all of your information in the show notes and in our newsletter. Thank you so much for being with us today. This was incredibly fascinating and I think it'll be really useful. And I really hope that uh, we can start integrating it more into uh, as an option for those patients that are really facing this challenge. I hope so too. And it's a pleasure being with you, Christina. Good luck to you and all the patients uh, and women and families who are listening.